If everything is determined, then what is your role as an agent? The idea of arguing for socialism on its merits doesn't really get too much play. The obstetric model of classical Marxism is reactionary. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast with the bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this week we are going to delve back into our parliamentary book club, going over G.A. Cohen's If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich. Uh, a couple episodes ago, it's been a little while, it's been almost a month actually since we delved into this, yeah? Has it really? Jesus, it feels like it. It's been a few weeks for sure, but the first episode we went through lectures one and two. Remember, this is a series of lectures that he presented uh, called the Gifford Lectures in the UK that's been compiled into a book. We went through chapters one and two. The first one was about the nature of belief and the idea of whether he kind of like examines irrational belief and talks about the idea that sort of at root that kind of all of us sort of have this unarticulable foundation or lack of foundation for many of our beliefs. And then chapter two is more autobiographical about his experience growing up in Canada in these uh, kind of like Marxist Jewish environment and some of the conflicts therein. And then chapter three and four now is really he starts to get into the meat of his argument in the text. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, also, as a reminder, our Patreon is up and live. If you think that we're providing value in your daily life somehow and you are able to support us, please jump over to Patreon. Five bucks a month will give you access to any and all bonus content, including the newsletter, as well as being able to suggest topics for a future uh, listener-led episode or series of episodes, as it turned out this last time. Um, and then for two bucks a month, you can just have access to being able to be involved with suggesting topics. And then we run a poll and stuff like that as well. Five bucks gives you the whole shebang. Two bucks gives you to democracy motherfuckers, which is what we're calling it. And I think that's pretty much admin shit at the outset. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So we're going to start the episode the way we start off every motherfucking episode. It's time for the shitty minute where one of us gets to rant and rave about whatever it is that's chapping our hide from this week. Troy, what's got you down, brother? So have you heard about this new uh, Journal of Controversial Ideas <laughs> thing? <laughs> yes, I have. And, I'm, kind of and I'm totally <laughs> not surprised that this is your <laughs> shitty minute. <laughs> yeah, and it almost was like a low, it was the most low-hanging fruit thing I could possibly have picked, right? But yeah. it's still worthwhile because it's some hardcore bullshit, right? So if you're unaware, Peter Singer is a famous uh, ethicist and philosopher um, and a few other philosophers in the UK – I uh, forget exactly who, Jeff McMahon maybe or somebody, have decided to start a new um, academic journal. Uh, and not just a philosophy journal. Apparently it's going to involve a number of different disciplines. But it'll be an academic journal, professional journal, that's dedicated to, as the title implies, controversial ideas. And so it'll be apparently entirely um, uh, via pseudonym, so pseudonymous. And that will enable, I guess, academics to uh, make claims and say things that, uh, via the description apparently, will enrage the left and the right. Um, and so this will apparently be a boon to academic research because reasons uh, which are not articulated uh, via argument, which is strange for a philosopher. But anyway, um, the entire enterprise seems like a huge publicity stunt more than anything. Any journal, journals already, if people are unaware, Academic journals have pseudonymous processes as they exist. Now, those oftentimes don't exactly work, but the basic idea is you submit a, an article for review and you do it and the people who review it and decide whether or not it's academically rigorous enough to be published don't have your name, right? It's um, the uh, pseudonym. And so you can't just go off the person's reputation by itself the uh, academic rigor of the actual article is what's at issue. Now, of course, people will complain that um, authors leave clues as to their identity in journals and often reference their own work, and it's often very clear via writing style and and elsewhere what's who the author actually is. And that's certainly true, right? Um, 
but that all those problems will apply to this journal as well. So that doesn't differentiate or distinguish this journal from any other journal. Um, I guess the idea here is that they're published pseudonymously as well. And so that's what's going to make it uh, or give the authors the ability to say things they otherwise wouldn't say because their um, academic institution would get mad at them or they'd get harassed online or whatever it is, right? Which, I mean, I guess harassment online is a thing, right? But is it an ex existential threat to being an academic for most people? It seems extremely isolated and episodic. I mean... Do you disagree? Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, you don't see continental philosophers jumping on this fucking bandwagon, do you? Oh, that's just a little bit of an anecdotal attack. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, I'm trying to think of think of like the. I mean, he's more of a political theorist, I guess, but he's a philosophical thinker. Uh, George Chicarella Mar, who got a tremendous amount of backlash because of his outspokenness, but nevertheless, I don't think he would want to hide behind a pseudonym to talk about the things about which he speaks, right? Like, I, I don't, I can't see him being somebody that would write some of the inflammatory stuff that he does on Twitter that has led to him, you know, potentially led, was, was a catalyst at least for him losing his position at Drexel and kind of got him caught up in a big shit storm where he's been attacked by various members of the alt-right and neo-Nazi groups, various white supremacist groups, uh, you know, his life has been threatened. Various people in it, around his life have been threatened. I can't imagine that he'd feel some sort of comfort and freedom to be like, well, I'm going to produce under the name, I don't know, some like generic white boy name or something like that because that'll somehow give him protection. I just can't imagine that he would do that. So I'm not even sure who is going to feel this freedom unless it's somebody who's kind of an asshole and wants to say yeah, some exactly. shit that they think is like either sexist or blatantly racist or – is like, well, you know what? I'm going to do a reading of Mein Kampf and why Mein Kampf is relevant for the 21st century, and I'm just going to see what people think kind of bullshit. And that's the only thing that I can really think is really going to benefit from this type of protection. Yeah, you can't benefit career-wise from publishing in this journal because it's pseudonymous, right? So you can't, like, submit it for tenure application, I'm, pres I'm presuming. Yeah, because that's the other thing. What do you, do you, don't, do you, put, you don't put it on your CV because then when you fucking go in for... Uh, uh, an interview or something like that, then they'll just be like, oh, this was the asshole that wrote the fucking pro-Nazi argument. Cool. Yeah, so you obviously wouldn't do that. So the only reason to publish here is to be an asshole. Like the number one, the number one lesson we learn from the existence of the internet is that anonymity breeds assholery, right? Yeah, exactly. The more anonymous you are, the more willing you are to just engage in pure resentment-fueled assholery. <laughs> and that's right. not any less true for academics than anybody else. Uh, as we know, through all kinds of experience. So all this will be, will be usually right-wing fueled resentment um, because one, that's the kind of resentment that gets the most play and people will actually get outraged about or gets the clicks and whatnot, right? Um, and because of publicity, yeah, it's the same thing, right? It's just gonna, that's the kind of thing that the journal will actually be able to survive on since it, academic sort of production or, um, you know, movement of someone's career, progression of someone's career is not going to be the issue here. So there's that. Or if they avoid that, if the editors actually do a better job, it's just going to be boring and no one's going to give a shit. Like, there's not going to be anything there of substance because people aren't doing it for their career. Um, in which case, I don't see the point of this. So it's either going to be sensationalist and, and, and terrible or just stupid and unnecessary. It's like this, there's this belief that someone's going to like reproduce the the uh luther's theses right like post them on the wall and then they're you know pseudonymous and so everyone's wondering who would dare to question the authority of the catholic church on the church door wall and it's like it's just totally fantastical image of the power academics have which of course is nothing right um and if that's what's feeling this then it's just it's just narcissistic like at best if not just if not just actually like an avenue for assholes. Well, and it, this was clearly the brainchild of a bunch of academics who are tenured. Because if this isn't going to progress in your career, how many young career academics are going to jump at the chance to publish pseudonymously for something that isn't going to advance them in a world where the only thing that matters 
in terms, especially in the United States, is how much you fucking publish so that you can get a tenure track position. And even then, you're never going to get a tenure track position and you're going to be stuck in precarious employment forever. So it seems that the only people really, I mean, yeah, there'll be the odd person every now and then that feels really motivated to be like, ah, I want to do something fun because I feel like I'm doing something meaningful because I'm making a statement or whatever the fuck their self justification is. But for the most part, it's going to be a bunch of dudes that are like, hey, I'm good, I'm cushy, and I'm just going to say some inflammatory shit so I can rub elbows with my friends at the next cocktail party and secretly tell them, by the way, I'm John P. Dickwad, you know, or whatever the pseudonym is that he goes under. And one thing we always know, dude, is that people at the top of the pyramid of power always have the best opinions <laughs> and are never biased in favor of structures which confirm their own power. So that will definitely be an avenue towards bringing voices to the fore, which otherwise would be silenced. And I'm not really sure that tenure track professors oftentimes are even the ones that are on the cutting edge. I mean, sometimes, of course, but a lot of times they get lazy. And a lot of times they're not really as interested in engaging with new emerging fields and new emerging information and transformative thoughtful ideas because they're a little bit more rigid, stuck in their ways, or whatever the various reasons are that prevent them from being as inventive. So even then, I'm not sure that the scholarship is really going to be that provocative, except at a cultural level, because it's going to be purely insightful. Not in S-I-G-H, but I-N-C-I-T-E. Insight, right? Yeah. And... I'm not sure that that's necessarily what the – like, why not just publish under a pseudonym at, um, like, Aeon Magazine or, you know, uh, The Conversation or what's the other one that will publish, like, long-form uh, philosophical – like, the News? Or no, not News. That's a – that's a, a, there's, there's a couple of them that are, like, they're more inclined towards long-form philosophical essays but that are generally, like, a, an educated, popular journal. I don't know. I, I, there are a few of them out there, but just publish in that shit. I don't understand why you're trying to have like a peer-reviewed academic journal that does this. It doesn't really seem to do much. Yeah, especially since if the point of it's just to engage in like popular conversation, then an academic journal is not exactly the best way to do that. You're getting a very specialized audience through that means. Yeah. I mean, whoever the PR brain was in this group is clearly a moron. <laughs> Or, or ingenious, but doesn't give a shit about, you know, having a moral compass. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. I mean, I say it, it depending on where they get their funding from. I mean, I guess you, you know, it doesn't take that much to run it, but you still got to, you're talking about time. It takes a lot of time to, you know, read through abstracts and then edit journals and stuff like that. I can't imagine that this is going to be very successful. Yeah, I don't think so either. But I give it on a that note, of we're five starting... Years. <laughs> on that note, Sorry. on that note, we're starting the podcast of controversial ideas next week. Are we? Yeah, it'll be us, but you won't know which one is which because we won't say our names <laughs> at the beginning of the episode. Uh, we're gonna have to talk through one of those voice phaser things, like they do <laughs> like in the Scream movie. <laughs> Hi, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs>All right, so for our main segment this week, we're talking about chapters three and four of G.A. Cohen's If You're an, Egal an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich. Uh, Austin, you did a good job summarizing the first two chapters uh, that we went through several weeks ago. But I think one thing you brought up in that first episode we did was there didn't seem to be an obvious direction. Like, why in the hell in this discussion of what's supposed to be, you know, Marxism and critiques of Marxism... Mm. is this talk about the justifications of our beliefs and um cohen's own you know jewish upbringing and things like that where does all this come from the real argument starts here and i think it's yeah. he's made some references in these chapters to how he's going to bring back those topics about uh, epistemic justification and and one's upbringing and stuff like that so that stuff is still relevant and we're going to get back to it but i think he's going to tie up those ends near to the end of the book is what it seems like. So mm. go back and listen to those first two episodes at some point um, just to sort of get an idea for where this argument's probably heading. Mm. Yeah, good point. So chapters three and four are almost like one. It could be one chapter, really. The, the fourth could chapter be. was just an extension, really, of the third chapter, I think. And it's talking mainly about um, Marxism, just defining straight up Marxism um specifically 
the idea of historical materialism and, and dialectical materialism. And Cohen purposefully, and he states this in the text, wants to argue for it as if he is fully on board with the whole thing. So in, in not a critical direction whatsoever. And then come back and show what it is he thinks is the problem um, with the overall kind of uh, traditional or classical Marxist idea. And he uses this metaphor of, I'm, I'm going to try to say this out loud, I haven't said it out loud before, obstetricism. Is that correct? So, you know, because obstet obstetrics is what what you, I mean, I think that's what like OBGYN do, right? Obstetrics is like the science of baby delivering. Or obstetrician, like they're called, So right? obstetrician, right. Yeah. So it's like the obstetric metaphor. Yeah, it's very difficult to say um, obstetricism, though. I, I still can't say it. Ob obstetricism. Obst <laughs> obstet obstetricism, yeah. Let's just say the obstetric metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. For some reason, it ends up sounding like, um, like a, uh, I don't know what it sounded like. Some other weird thing. What, what's the, the giant bird that's on two legs? An uh, ostrich. An ostrich? <laughs> I keep thinking yeah. ostracism. <laughs> oh, yeah, or, like you're ostracized? Or, or like, uh, yeah, ostracism or ostrichism. Yeah, ostrichism would be fucking cool, man. Like, <laughs> our pseudonymous podcast should be called Ostriches with Their Head in the Sand. That's a long name, dude. I'm not sure that'll fit on iTunes. Yeah, well. All right, so we got the obstetric metaphor. Right. And the basic idea, as you were saying, Austin, is about the... Uh, Delivering babies, right? And yep. the way this is applied to Marxism is Cohen's going to argue that classical Marxism basically has this obstetric view of political change and that um, political change essentially happens necessarily and the job of the political theorist and the political actor both is to sort of make the birth pangs easier. Deliver the baby, but the baby's coming out no matter what. Just make the birth pangs easier to deal with. So like smooth out the process rather than actually be an active, um, an active engagement with the change or an, an active cause um, of the change. You don't really have much agency um, as an individual. You're more just sort of on the sidelines watching and contributing a little bit. But what's going to happen is going to happen really anyway, it seems. And that's about mm. what the metaphor is doing. Yeah, I mean, immediately right now, I know some Marxists are going to be like, whoa, hold on a second here. That's not true because, you know, in the 18th Brumaire, Marx is talking about how man makes history to precisely the extent that history makes man sort of thing. But what what Cohen is arguing against is a more sort of economistic, deterministic variant, which is probably the more dominant theoretical thread within Marxist thought. And it's the idea that the laws of history lead to the necessity of revolution. That socialism isn't something that is forced by the will of the people coming out of nowhere. That's actually Marxist criticism of the utopian socialists. But rather that the socialist consummation, that, that, that socialism is the consummation, the necessary consummation that is the next development of historical progress that emerges out of the conditions of capitalism, that sort of overturns, that repurposes the already existing historical material, structural historical material conditions that make up the thing that we call capitalism, the, the, uh, the system that we call capitalism. And socialism is the overturning of the asymmetries of power that that system proliferates. But it's necessary and, it's, and it will happen. And that's the, the strain of the argument or the variant, let's say, of the argument that he's most forcefully concerned with. And it's important to say that even, even some people who want to be like, well, hey, you don't necessarily have to be an, econom uh, an economistic or deterministic Marxist to still kind of position yourself within that lineage. The point is, is that this is partly Marx and Engels' fault, as well as their interpreters, who, who talk about this sort of thing very often. And there are many quotes, and, and Cohen goes through many of them, where Engels and Marx basically they use this obstetric model and he's not just saying this isn't just a metaphor that he's creating this is something that he's deriving from the very words of Engels and Marx themselves so it's it's a very expositional critique it's not just a purely conceptual or theoretical critique 
yeah, he really goes out of his way to show in the text and even from um, others like Lenin and, Le- and uh, Rosa Luxemburg and others that this, this metaphor was kind of a guiding right. idea. Um, it wasn't just a thing that was occasionally used metaphorically. It was, it was really guiding the thinking of um, the revolutionary thinkers. And um, he even goes back and, and kind of traces it back to the, the critique of utopian socialism, like you said just a minute ago. But I think it's important to talk about because it really sets the stage for why someone would think this way in the first place. Mm. And so um, this, this difference, this distinction between utopian and scientific socialism is an important one to, to talk about, I think, because it's important for understanding what Cohen's, um, understanding Cohen's summary of Marx here. And also, I think he's going to come back to it probably because he's not going to be talking about a return to utopian socialism, um, which he's going to kind of agree, I think, with some of Marx's critiques of utopian socialism. So we can talk about that for a second. Yeah. Mm hmm. Sounds good. So utopian socialism was um, did Marx actually use that term? I can't remember. He does refer to the utopians. He doesn't say utopian socialists as much, but he does refer to the – oh, no. Oh, maybe he doesn't say utopians, but he does call them the socialists. That's what it is. Um, and they were yeah. the French socialists when he was uh, in France at the time. Right. And um, it gets confusing for uh, sort of introductory readers of Marx, right? Because you hear him disparaging socialists. And you're like, what the hell is going on, right? <laughs> but you have to understand there's a there's a sort of um, – that term is being used to – sort of group in a reference specifically, as you said, French socialism, which was undialectical. It didn't have the Hegelian heritage that Marx has in philosophy. Um, and is largely involved in a more moralistic critique of capitalism. Um, so the French socialists wanted a better world. Uh, and they critiqued capitalism from a moralistic perspective, saying that it you know, does these terrible things, has these poor outcomes. For people who live in poverty and who are exploited and so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, and then says, therefore, we should have a better system than capitalism. And so some form of socialism seems to be that thing. Um, and Marx's critique, essentially, is that while they're correct that, they're, that capitalism has these uh, negative ex- externalities, right? They have no accounts of how capitalism is the way it is and how it will necessarily have to change eventually to socialism because of the contradictions inherent within it. And without that kind of an analysis and critique, you don't have really political critique or, um, you know, like political economy in the sense Marx wants to do it. In the Hegelian sense, you don't have the sort of the necessary outcome of the problem, necessary outcome of the solution within the problem itself. Um, And in that sense, there's really nowhere to go with that kind of a critique. So that's basically the, the sense in which Marx calls these, these socialists utopian. They have this sort of fantastical or idealistic dream of a better world, which is good, but then there's no actual way to bring that about as a political theorist or agent if you don't understand the contradictions inherent within capitalism first. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I I really love this. From our perspective, it would be an a reversal of a sort of understanding of of a sort of rational understanding of political economy. His argument is that the French socialists thought that capitalism was irrational, which, which you know, in our world now, like we tend to be inundated by the sort of neoclassical model, which is that the market and that capitalism is actually the site of rationality itself, right? So that like rationality is the thing that occurs, that is like the emergent process that occurs when market actors are led to their own resources and their own devices, and they're able to sort of efficiently distribute resources according to, you know, individual interests or the profit motive or whatever it is that's guiding things. And so there's this interesting discussion of rationality and irrationality here um, that kind of like governs the criticism. And then Marx kind of comes along and says, well, actually, the French socialists are irrational and reactionary, but for a different reason. It's not because, you know, of of the neoclassical argument, but it's because that they don't really have a proper understanding of the real material, the the real material or historical conditions, you know, out of which their thought emerges, or uh, out of which a sort of supersession would emerge. And I found that to be kind of interesting. It's a nice sort of like, I don't know, a sort of deconstruction, if you will, of these various debates and things that are going on at the time. Yeah, that was interesting too. And I was trying to think about like a modern correlate to that, but. Couldn't really come up with something. Did you have any ideas on that? 
Mm, no. Like, in what way? A, a correlate in what way? Like, maybe the critique of some um, leftist politics in the U.S. has a similar utopian element to it. And so, like, it can be critiqued uh, as being utopian in that sense. Um, say, maybe the Bernie Kratz advocating for various policies like Medicare for all without having a bill. That seems to be kind of a similar idea, but it doesn't come from this dialectical okay, kind of I, critique at all. I think I think that, and I don't know if I buy this 100%, but I think if, if we're going to play along with the same game that Cohen is and just kind of like agree with, with the argument and follow along with what Marx and, and Engels' arguments are, I think that they would level the same criticism towards the Occupy Wall Street movement or towards what we talked about with Brett from Rev Left Radio in our Accelerationist Manifesto episode about the critique against folk politics or horizontalism, that it is trying to build a world that is from the outside, that doesn't necessarily uh, just enfold naturally as a sort of supersession that is induced from the very conditions of the present material condition, but that is trying to sort of like uh, exist within the interstices, the, the the spaces that aren't necessarily there, and create a new world. And I I, I think I mentioned Eric Olin Wright, how he has these four, uh, he delineates these four anti-capitalist positions. One is smash capitalism. One is tame capitalism. One is erode capitalism, which is the one he ends up agreeing with. But the one that I think would be the undialectical, the utopian in the Marx sense, would be the escape capitalism, that you can kind of build a whole new world that isn't necessarily like uh, an eroding slash smashing or repurposing of the material conditions that uh, that you are thrown into, which would be a much more Marxian, Engelsian approach and maybe more like we would say traditional Marxist approach to things. Uh, whereas, and I think it's important to make this clarification, that for Marx, utopian doesn't mean naively optimistic about the future, that you're just kind of creating these grand futures, but it means that you are actually insufficient in your analysis of the real material conditions. We might even say that they're nihilists in the way that we talked about in our Prozorov text, that they don't really understand things, but there's like this imperfect nihilism, that they're sort of just kind of, impo they're, they're inflating and then imposing an image onto the landscape rather than deriving principles from the landscape. Yeah, utopian isn't about the grandeur of your analysis. It's about the kind of analysis, right? Yeah. Um, which he's saying is, is inappropriate for the for political theory. And um, by the way, Eric Olin Wright, you just mentioned, student yeah. of G.A. Cohen. Oh, well, fucking A. You know what's funny? I was thinking about him a lot, actually, while I was reading this. Um, because one of the things that Cohen mentions that we can get into with regards to this idea of eroding capitalism, which is Eric Olin Wright's term for it, that, that Cohen talks about with this idea of reform that we'll get into probably in a little bit. I thought it was really, it sort of like made me, I, I was thinking about that a lot because I've been a little critical of Eric Olin Wright's uh, support of various reform policies as being sort of insufficiently anti-capitalist because they still reproduce the logic of capital. They don't actually challenge the value form. They don't actually challenge the uh, the commodity form. They don't actually challenge the libidinal economy, like what you desire and why you desire what you desire. All it does is make sort of more pacified proletarians. And Cohen literally says that in this article or in one of these <laughs> lectures. He's like, if you are against these humanizing reforms, and he uses that idea of humanizing, he's like, um, that's just, I, I don't remember, I think, I don't know if he says it's, what does he say? He doesn't say it's absurd or vulgar, but he uses a word that's like, it's disgusting. And uh, repugnant, I think is what he says. It's a repugnant, it's repugnant to oppose those things because those are humanizing reforms. And the issue is not, it shouldn't just simply be to sit back and be like, well, how dare we fight for labor struggles and the increase of minimum wage and the lessening of the work week and maybe even things like a universal basic income, at least theoretically. If we don't think they work practically, that's different. But if on the theoretical grounds you oppose them because you're just going to produce more pacified people, um, how can you do that from a humanistic perspective? Because they are humanizing principles and humanizing policies. And I was like, oh, that's a really fucking stinging argument, Cohen. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's going to bring that up again because the title of the book seems to be kind of about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the practical value of some of these things. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I wanted to bring that up too because I was thinking about Gorz's non-reformist reforms. Right. Um, and thinking about that's kind of intentionally a vague idea, right? What actually does erode capitalism? It's a pretty speculative notion. Um, mm -hmm. So you can always have little, you know, 
little fights over what exactly counts as a reformist uh, program or a non-reformist one. Well, Cohen's definition, I think, is really quite lovely. The, the reformism that we should be opposed to is the reformism that doesn't actually have any grander vision. It's the reformism that just simply bakes itself, let's say, at the level of popular political policy, that just simply deals with what's going on in Congress and casting our vote and that sort of thing. Oh, I'm going to be a progressive. So I think his criticism, Cohen's criticism, would actually be against people like the Young Turks or um, I don't know about like certain social Democrats in the United States, but let's say like the Elizabeth Warren types that don't seem yeah. to be as – anti-capitalist, maybe even some of the Bernie types that are like, hey, let's just so let's just like beef up the welfare state again, but not actually confront the conditions of capitalism per se. Like maybe even the Norwegian or Scandinavian model would 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 uh, be the target of some of Cohen's criticisms here because there's not the intent to ultimately transform uh, on the outset, to actually erode to the point where it cannot survive any longer. Yeah, I think you're right about the the war and stuff, especially like the accountable capitalism idea and humane capitalism idea, right? Which people on the right have said too, but they're obviously lying when they say it. And people on the left say it, and I think they're honest about about wanting to humanize capitalism. And that's the I think the target of of the critique. The Scandinavian model, maybe parts of it, but I do think there's also maybe we can talk about this later. But you can talk about things like um, the kind of welfare state that exists in like Norway. Right, where you have massive public ownership, um, which is growing, right? It's not just like a static property, it's continuously growing, right? With social wealth funds and whatnot, as possibly being a kind of non reformist reform. Although, again, it's one of those things where it's in what's in maybe one sense it's kind of eroding capitalism, in another sense, maybe it's making it stronger. It's kind of hard to say, yeah. And I think, I think for him, he would say, uh, as a voter and as an activist, I'm, I'm still going to support those reform movements, and I'm going to support the expansion of social wealth funds and uh, the the opening up of the commons, I think he would support that. But at the same time, be like, but let's not forget what the point is, right? Yeah. Let's still have that vision. And this is what I think is lovely at the conclusion, and we're foreshadowing, but, you know, let's not forget that we still have to create recipes for the final meal, right? The, the phrase is, I wrote this down, we must write recipes for f future kitchens, I love that because he's mixing Which, metaphors, right? Yeah, he purposely mixes the metaphors to make it confusing. But it, it's so clever that, yeah, I loved it. I knew you'd bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I loved it. I loved it. So, okay, so that's foreshadowing a little bit. We'll get there. But so let's get back to how Cohen is uh, engaging with Marx's criticism of this utopianism. It's the idea, again, that it's not about... Uh, the positing, like we usually think of utopian as like, oh my God, you're just a utopian. Like you're just so naive and optimistic and think that everyone's going to be singing Kumbaya around the fire. That's not what Marx says utopianism is. It's more about you don't have a clear understanding of the real material conditions of the world, which means that, and this goes to, I love that Zizekian quote where he says it's easier to under, to, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism because the capitalist, the neoliberal, the, the person that is embedded under the logic of capitalism is the utopian. Utopian, because they can't even imagine the end of capitalism because they are so uh, they are so ignorant of the real historical material trajectory of things to so the real condition of things. So that would be the Marxian argument about uh, yeah. utopianism, and not even the end of capitalism, even the origins of it, right? And you see this, <laughs> right. you see this in parts, right, where it's like this assumption that everything pre, you know, mercantilist capitalism was leading up to capitalism. It was kind of a capitalism in disguise, right? Or just a poor resourced, poorly resourced capitalism. People say um, this about like just barter economy and stuff like that. Like fucking they use, you know, all kinds of like in traditional societies or archaic societies like that they were proto-capitalist, you know? Yeah. And David Graeber has come out and kind of shown that that wasn't actually true at all, right? This kind of assumption that um, proto-capitalism in the form of barter economies existed until we had the infrastructure to have you know fully formed capitalism right this even goes so far back as to like the new testament right do you remember um the parable of the talents brother this i have had so many debates with people about the parable of the talents <laughs> yeah so for those who don't know the parable of the talents is a parable that jesus tells is it part of the um the olivet discourse i don't remember where it's, it it's is. right around there 
like Matthew mm-hmm. 24 ish or something. I don't remember Sounds exactly. Right. Yeah. But the basic idea is um, a uh, property owner gives three, uh, is it three sons or three workers? It's three workers. Yeah. Um, a certain number of talents, which were a kind of currency um, during the day. And told them to uh, invest it and do wise with it. And he'd come back eventually and reward or punish them based upon their work, right? And um, the first two workers take their talents and invest them and come back with huge gains. And the third one buries his talent in the sand uh, and doesn't do anything, comes back and just brings the original talent back when the uh, master comes back home. And he's, uh, you know, chastised, punished for it. And it's funny, the lesson that any evangelical seems to take from this is that the word talent mysteriously actually was referring to the English word talent, which means like your abilities. And so you should invest your abilities by using the abilities God gave you and progress them so that when you die, God can say you used your abilities well. It's such a weird uh, anachronistic idea. But then even those who recognize that that's total bullshit, eisegetical work, We'll say something like, um, this is sort of Jesus's uh, defense of capitalism and that you should take your resources, your assets, and you should invest them and get money for them. And if you don't, you're actually kind of sinning in a Mm. certain way because God gave you that money to invest it and make money off of it, Um, which totally misses the point of what all parables do. The third person in a parable is always doing the right thing. That's Mm. what happens in all of Jesus's parables. So if you would look at it from this perspective, it's the, if it's the same structure as every other parable which surrounds the parable of the talents, then the person who buried the thing actually did the right thing, which means that the first two people who invested their talents got huge uh, gains off of those talents. I can't remember how much it was, but it's an unseemly amount. The only way to do that in the ancient world is through massive exploitation and theft, basically. Mm. Organized crime. Like mafia type work, right. um, you know, without guns and Italians and stuff. So they obviously, and anybody who was hearing this parable would have known that the only way this, these two people could have gotten these huge gains is by exploiting people like them, right? Fishermen and poor people, working people. I would have seen them as kind of villains of a sort. And the person who buried their talent refused to engage in this behavior. And the master chastised them for it. The master's the bad guy. The master's not God. Mm. in this uh this parable um and so really it's i think it's if anything it's a critique of things like exploitation uh, Mm. than it is actually sort of in a weird way telling you to do it which doesn't fit the surrounding text at all either it's a totally you know out of nowhere um parable at the point of it's to be investment is good right yeah yeah yeah, I mean, without going too far, I'll just say my favorite one that I think is the maybe even more egregious interpretation is the one about the uh, the master who owns the uh, the plot of land and hires laborers and agrees to pay them a denarius, which is a day's wage. And, you know, the person that works the full day or the half day or the one that comes at the end of the day, they all get the same payment. And then at the end, they go to him and they're like, hey, like – what's up, man? We worked a full day. This person only came at the end of the day. How come we all get the same payment? And then Jesus says, but, you know, is he not, or, or, and then the, the guy says, but, you know, am I not able to uh, determine how it is that I divvy out uh, my payment or whatever it is or something like that? Do I not own this land sort of thing? And then Jesus says something like, so too will be the kingdom or something along those lines. And Christians love to take this as like a justification of private property. They're like, or, see? Or like wealth inequality. <laughs> yeah, and wealth inequality, private property. It's like, see, Jesus is saying, because he owned it. Like, he he owned the means of production. It's like, motherfucker, <laughs> that is not at all what's going on. This this parable has to do with grace. And it has to do with, like, who it is that's going to receive the kingdom in terms of salvific terms, not fucking economic terms here. But Even if it was, it'd be a justification of a basic income. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, gosh. All right. yeah, so those are just examples of how this kind of idea of proto-capitalism is the case, right? So, yeah, uh, neoliberalism can't really even theorize or imagine either the origins or the end of capitalism. It just always must be the case since it's the only rational economic form. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the idea that uh, Cohen describes here, he uses, I think it's Lenin's 
um, explanation of how Marx critiqued utopian socialism and introduced this idea of scientific socialism in its stead. Mm. And it's by combining three different strands of, of thinking um, that were prevalent in Western Europe at the time. Yeah, it's from, it's from Lenin's text, The Three Sources uh, and Component Parts of Marxism. A very accurately described title. Yes. Um, those three sources are, one, German philosophy, where Marx gets the dialectical idea. And this is the idea uh, Cohen summarizes as something like um, self-destruction through self-fulfillment of one's own nature, um, which I thought was a kind of helpful way of describing dialectics. I like I like what he talked about. It's sort of like the expression of the inner essence. And then he talks about the self-destruction aspect. I kind of yeah. like that. Yeah. Eventually there's eventually there's self-differentiation, right? Yeah, I Which like that. Which creates something new. Not that I like the idea. I mean, I'm I'm still working through that perpetually, but I like the definition of it. Yeah. And then there's um, the second source is French socialism, which we talked about was this kind of moralistic critique of capitalism, the utopian idea, which Marx says is good because in a sense that kind of has to come first. Um, there has to be a critique of capitalism before you can have the more dialectical critique that he's going to posit. And the third uh, source is English economics. So this is kind of political economy in the guise of we know from like Adam Smith and David Ricardo and others. And that was mostly existent or extant in England at the time. And of course, it advocated for capitalism as the best formed ideal economic system. But its method allowed Marx to uh, to take this form and show that eventually it would sort of destroy itself by fulfilling its own nature, using kind of taking the dialectical idea and applying it to the way that English economics um, had analyzed capitalism. Mm. And I think it's really important to also recognize the historical circumstances that led to these being the three sources and component parts of Marx's theoretical development. German philosophy was derived from his early years as a student, from his early fascination as a, a member of like the young Hegelians. French socialism became introduced during his first exile in France, when he was in France and inundated by and encountering this French socialism. And then he started to engage with British political economy when he was again exiled in England. And he's looking at the state of factory workers. Uh, he starts working with Angles. And I think that, that that's really important to understand because this kind of reminds me of the first lecture where it's like, what if he had just stayed in Germany his whole life? You know, and and how is it that the historical circumstances and accidents of our lives inform how we think and perhaps over determine our own analyses and maybe therefore lead to a limited and limiting way by which we interpret the world? And I'm just going to leave that there because I think that that will come up in a bit. Yeah, it's definitely going to come up. Um, there's a reason why I think he started with that discussion about uh, your background and your epistemic justification and then talks so much about Marx's own life playing a huge role in this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the basic idea then, or the dialectical idea, as he calls it, is that the um, utopian socialism um, which exists in France will eventually be replaced by scientific socialism when um, the sort of, when people gain class consciousness, right? When the proletariat realizes its own place in historical development, it will come to its consciousness of itself, right? And then we'll actually have an understanding of how uh, capitalism's internal contradictions will eventually and necessarily lead to revolution and socialism. And Marx's job as political theorist and agent is to sort of stoke that realization, which of course will come anyway, um, so that the process can actually go smoother than it maybe otherwise would. Mm. Yeah, he says, I like this, he says, the problem posed by capitalism as Marx and Engels envisaged it. The problem is to describe it simply of massive power to produce alongside massive property. And as that problem deepens, its solution looms as and because the problem deepens. So the solution to the problem looms because the problem becomes more apparent. And that's one of the things. And then he has a, he's, he, there's a quote by Engels from um, 
uh, from Engels' book Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, where he says, this is a quote from Engels, he says, to accomplish this act of universal emancipation is the historical mission of the modern proletariat, to thoroughly comprehend the historical conditions and thus the very nature of this act, to impart to the now oppressed proletarian class a full knowledge of the conditions and of the meaning of the momentous act it is called upon to accomplish. This is the task of the theoretical expression of the proletarian movement, scientific socialism. In other words, and then Cohen sums it up, the revolution is the problem's solution. Yeah, I think you're exactly right earlier to bring up accelerationism. I'm seeing that everywhere now, right? Mm -hmm. Accelerationism similarly describes the contradictions inherent within capitalism and sort of stoking the contradictions so as to bring about the necessary solution to the problem. Right. And I think it's important to think of this. This is what was ringing in my head constantly. So we've got this obstetric model that... That history is experiencing birth pangs. And he has this really lovely syllogism that he expresses later where he talks about that the relationship between the base and the ideas. Were you going to get there in a minute? Did you just li- did you just say the words lovely syllogism? Uh, You're becoming I'm sorry. an analytic philosopher. I'm sorry. I take speak. it back. This disgusting <laughs> syllogism that, it, that insidiously incepted my mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. No, it was this lovely syllogism about this relationship between the base and the ideas that like uh, the economic modalities have reflections in, let's say, cultural ideas. Right. And we can we can understand shifts uh, in the economic modalities by understanding the changing ideas. So if there's a resentment, if there's a collective resentment at the level of cultural ideas, for example, a, a working class resentment, then that's directly because of the um the causes at the level of the economic modalities that are producing said uh, discomfort or frustration or anxiety or whatever at the level of uh, the proletarian ideas, right? So, and then he kind of goes on from there as well. But the thing that I think is so interesting to to kind of think through is that he, he's setting up this obstetric model by basically saying that that the birth pangs of history are felt. People are angry and Uh, at the level of the ideas, right? And that proves then that the contradictions of capitalism are reaching some pinnacle, right? And this is the Marxist argument, the obstetric Marxist argument. And so therefore, as, as good midwives, the Marxist theorist or the Marxist activist is there to deliver the baby, to, to, provide a condition that allows for that smooth transition to, I don't know, bring rags and various other medicines and to place the mother in a bathtub or whatever the midwifery tactic or technique is in this particular instance, however we want to press this (laughs) metaphor, right? That's the goal of the theorist, to provide a better, safer environment for the birth that is going to take place to actually take place. Here's the thing that I think is so interesting, though, is that he then argues, and this is something that comes directly from Marx and Engels, uh, he, then, he, he then lays out, I should say, Cohen lays out the argument, that utopian socialism was necessary at the time. So that Marx isn't like critical of the utopian socialists because they were idiots. It's just that they weren't quite at the right point in history to really understand uh, capitalism properly. But that Marx and Engels were. And so their elaboration of scientific socialism was a almost determined outcome of the unfolding of history expressing itself or thinking itself. And they actually talk about this, and I can't remember if I wrote the quote down, but it's basically that scientific socialism is uh, socialism becoming conscious of itself, right? Which is yeah. a sort of Hegelian notion that that spirit is expressing itself through these various cultural modalities and and the more that it expresses itself in, let's say, like advanced cultural civilizations, the more spirit is knowing itself. Uh, it's very similar sort of thing going on here, at least analogously. And maybe even more than that, and I, I think Cohen thinks more than that. He actually talks about it as being a return of the Hegelian repressed, which I think was a really lovely turn of phrase. But beyond that, without front-loading that argument, at the very least, there's something about this idea that scientific socialism, according to Marx and Engels, was like the fulfillment of consciousness emerging out of a previously a pre-conscious uh, historical moment. Here's my concern, though. So let's even grant that that might be the case. But what if the birth pangs that you're feeling are just like super, 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 super early contractions, right? <laughs> Or like, what if what you think are birth pangs is actually indigestion, but you're just afraid because you know you're pregnant, 
but you're actually just feeling indigestion. So you've identified the wrong symptom and, and uh, attributed it to the wrong cause. Or what if you're not pregnant, but you have cancer, right? And so what if the pain that you're feeling isn't pregnancy, but it's, it's, it's a stomach cancer? Or what if you're not only pregnant, but you're pregnant and you have cancer, but the pain that you're feeling is a combination of the two, and this doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that you're dilating or something like that, right? And, or maybe history just isn't ready to give birth, or maybe history uh, is ready to give birth. And or maybe there's no capital H history. <laughs> maybe yeah, or maybe there's no capital yeah. history, which would be like the post-structuralist argument. But so then I was starting to think that the accelerationist, I think, would if we're going to force them into this this series of metaphors, would be that they would say, sure, maybe utopian science or socialism was necessary, maybe scientific socialism was necessary, but now we need like hyperstitional socialism, right? And I think the accelerationist argument would be, or, or something along those lines, a different type of socialism. It's an expansion. It's a sort of either a synthesis of the utopian scientific or it's the next stage in historical development uh, that, would, that would be the theoretical articulation of, what's, uh, of what the historical moment is providing that would supersede scientific as it was necessary in its time in the middle of the 1800s in England examining, you know, uh, industrial capitalism, but now under the conditions of late capitalism, we actually need to stop thinking in terms of scientific socialism because that's a 19th century framework of thinking, but there, there's a different type of theoretical frame, something that is, I don't know what to articulate it or to call it, but something that isn't either the utopian or the scientific, but it would be this third or maybe even fourth iteration. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think Cohen's critique is, is somewhere on that line, but I think there's some differences in that he just critiques this this dialectical idea as just being hopelessly optimistic is the word he uses for it. He says it leads to a false optimism about sort of when and how easily a solution to the contradictions of capitalism will become available, right? The arguments that they'll become available once they're guaranteed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and this all stems from the Hegelian uh, dialectics at the root of it. And he thinks that's just wrong. It's just incorrect. And it led to a false optimism that the permeated everyone from Lenin to Luxembourg to, to others. And it clearly had disastrous results in a lot of ways. And so he, he, he doesn't just want to say, oh, we, just, we, mis we mistook birth pangs for the water breaking. Or we mistook, um, uh, what was the term you used? I don't know. The baby kicking for... Oh, dilating uh, or something. Yeah, yeah, for the actual water breaking and the birth happening, right? We mistook it, right? We did a right, or, poor or job. indigestion or something like that. Yeah, we did a poor job at, at the diagnostic uh, part of the process. Uh, he wants to go much further than that and just say, no, the, the whole idea that we can actually diagnose the progress of history and the way that Hegel and Marx turning Hegel on his head and talking about material production instead of you know the spirit production, um, that's just all wrong. And it had mm -hmm. disastrous results and we should not do it again. So he's got a much more, I think, radical critique um, and I think that, you know, that kind of thinking, even though it's not sort of Hegelian really anymore, does still exist, right? I mean, I think like Star Trek and that, that kind of thinking, which permeates a lot of the like libertarian superheroes who even Musk and Bezos and all these people, they talk about being socialists a lot of times. And I know Bezos reads a lot of like sci-fi mm -hmm. uh, socialist literature about the future and how... Um, and then inevitably, we're going to have a Star Trek future where we, you know, share all material goods. And once the uh, material duplicator exists, then we're going to have mm. we're going to have to abolish private property and whatnot. Right. Um, and they talk about all that stuff. Right. Um, and I think it's kind of similar. I think it's it was called a saying, replicator for all the, yeah, nerd the replicator. fans that are out there. They're going to be angry. They're going to be like the replicator. Damn it. Yeah, that's what I was searching for. I know what it is. <laughs> um, by the way, when you go in the transporter, you die. Just pointing that out. Turn one out there. <laughs> Um, so that kind of thinking is, I think, similar in its dialectical mode, right? It's mm -hmm. almost like defending capitalism because we're not there yet. We're not towards the end of capitalist production and we have to wind it all the way down before we can get to our Star Trek future. So exploit, exploit, exploit in the meantime. Which is the bad accelerationist argument, right? Which is why some people are critical of accelerationism because 
there are some people that have leaned in that direction. That's like, well, fuck it. Let's just spend and consume and spend and consume so that we get to the point where we really primed the pumps. And now it's really time for, uh, the, 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 the his, for history to give birth to socialism, I guess we'll say. And some people look at that as like, well, that's just fucking disgusting. But I don't think that the accelerationists are making that argument. They're not the left accelerationists. Definitely not no, Nick I'm, and Alex. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not. I'm just talking about people on the right who, who you know, are, are center left who make similar yeah. arguments. Yeah, they kind of have an accelerationism in their, in their whole frame, don't they? But it's like a really, really far flung accelerationism, right? It's like a, yeah. in the far future, we're going to have to be socialists. But in the meantime, the capitalist mode of production hasn't run itself dry yet. And we need to do that first. And that kind of, that in a weird way follows from part of this argument, right? Now, Marx and, Heg- or Marx and uh, Engels both believed that they were sort of at the point where class consciousness was going to happen. And then the revolution would soon happen afterwards, right? Right. Um, but you could also just be like, yeah, I agree with you about the, historical process but this disagree about where we are on the in the nine months right until birth Hmm. um which trimester that we're at maybe we're still in the second it kind of reminds me a little bit of like in the new testament when paul is writing these letters to different churches like the thessalonians and telling them you know the end is coming soon and that has to sort of fit how your church is organized and how you behave um but then don't go too crazy and like stop working, right? Because um, you got to keep you know the whole thing running until the end actually comes. There's all this worry about what do we do because the end's coming soon, and mm. how how radical do we actually act given that we're not expecting to live much longer in the before the world ends? Mm. And like, there's a similar idea here in how the early Christians had to sort of modify that position as it got further and further away from you know the temple being destroyed and whatnot, and, and Christ still hadn't come back yet. Mm. Yeah, this is kind of an aside, but this fits into that. And I'm glad you brought this up because I be- I was reading this and obviously he set up the sort of three guiding motifs at the outset of the lecture series where he says he's Marxism, uh, like liberal egalitarianism and Christianity slash religion, right? It, which he hasn't gotten into religion really at all or uh, libertarian or egalitarian liberalism or liberal egalitarianism, whatever you want to call it. But um. So I've been thinking a lot about the relationship between kind of what he's talking about here and Christianity. And I thought there are a couple of things in particular. One, that very same tension that you're talking about with regards to, okay, if this is the end times, then how are we supposed to, as agents, respond? How are we supposed to live in the end times, so to speak, right? Which led to one kind of like dark thought that I want to run by you. But two, I think the other one was just this idea that if everything is determined, then what is your role as an agent, Right, And this is the same sort of thing that Calvinists in particular or reformed Christians, let's say, run into quite often. You know, uh, the more sort of Arminian Christian types, the Calvary Chapel types, don't really run into it because they believe in free will and they believe God wouldn't do anything to violate that free will. And so there's sort of like a, a strange, flimsy compatibilism in their understanding of the idea of God's sovereignty or God's providence. But not with reformed Christians, right? Reformed Christians think that everything is determined. And so if that's the case, then there's all this, there's this wrestling, like, okay, then what is our relationship as agents? And I think that there is something to be said also with this idea of like an economic determinism or a historical determinism, that if it is true that history will consummate in socialism, then what does that mean for us as agents? Like, what are we supposed to do? And then this, this leads to like my dark thought that I had. And it was basically, and I wrote it down. Uh, so let me see. And, and the thoughts might be scattered, so forgive me here. I said... Do you think that there's a sense in which Marxists almost need to force a negative view of the world sometimes or a more apocalyptic vision of the current state of affairs in order to make it seem as though it really is the right time for revolution? That is, is there a tendency to focus only on the negative and to maybe even perversely revel in the negative aspects of capitalist exploitation in order to realize this and point wherein socialism must break forth. Kind of like when Christians do the same thing uh, with regards to the idea of like living in the end times and everyone's a fucking antichrist and, and stuff like that. And that they seem to focus so much on like, this person's the new antichrist. No, this person, the world is falling apart. Ah, the apocalypse is coming. The Lord is returning. Except Imminent. for the most obvious antichrist. <laughs> right, exactly. The one who actually is the Antichrist. Um, but do you think that there might even be that tendency? And I know that's more of like a psychoanalytic question, but I was my thoughts were kind of 
I, I was wrestling through some of these things. Yeah, I mean, I got to think through that some more, but I do see what you're saying and that I can kind of point in my own mind to anecdotal experiences and things you see on the internet where it does seem like even Marx himself, right, wants to admit that capitalism had some pretty in- incredible and amazing improvements in terms of resource allocation and production of wealth and whatnot, right? Um, beginning of capital starts off with that kind of in praise of capitalism, um, which fits with the same dialectical idea, right? But it can be hard to talk about that today. Like here's the amazing things that capitalism does or the positive effects that it has because right. you want to make it seem like the end times, like we're ripe for revolution because you want there to be, right? Um, the idea of arguing for socialism on its merits doesn't really get too much play because that's what liberals do right they argue for things on their merits Mm. they don't have historical understanding and that you know goes back to the whole critique of utopian socialism right and i think cohen's gonna try to meet those two in the middle or at least in a sense bridge the the gap that the two of them seem to uh, not be able to in having historical self-understanding, but also realizing that historical self-understanding does not bring about a necessary historical conclusion. Mm. And he seems to point towards making that combination of claims. Uh, Mm. At some point, he even references a quote by Luxembourg and says basically that. And so that's what I find super interesting about Mm. this because I I definitely do think you see that tendency in kind of more traditional Marxist circles. And I get why it's there. It's because you want to avoid that utopian idea and the tendency of, you know, liberals to have technocratic solutions to things that totally ignore anything about history. Um, and so I get why it's the case, but it doesn't seem like it's necessarily the best way to answer the problem. And then he also wants to uh, criticize or let's say problematize the scientific notion because he wants to, he wants to object to the obstetric metaphor because he says it encourages a cavalier attitude, but it does not justify it. And this goes to his discussion in this chapter five, uh, or chapter four, I'm sorry, um, about mathematics. And I know we don't need to belabor this too much, but basically the, his point in kind of talking about Hegel and Schopenhauer's criticism of mathematics is that mathematics is very good at articulating the what and the that, but not really interested in the why. And I think he sort of criticizes uh, a lot of the scientific socialists for being similarly inclined. They don't really have a sufficient articulation of the why. They're very good with analysis of the that and the what, but they don't really have the why, which we might call a meta-ethical frame. Or what we talked about previously in my shitty minute last week, we might call that like a mythos or what he calls it here is like a plan, right? He calls it a plan. And... Even though you can look at like the five-year plans in the Soviet Union and you can look at people who do have images that are guiding them like, oh, we want, like a, we want equality for all or something along those lines. Those things are important, but I don't think that those things are sufficient uh, for Cohen at least to really sort of be a strategic vehicle that guides uh, a sort of more robust understanding of socialism that he wants to try to develop. Yeah, and I want to be clearly the first, um, I do agree with you about kind of taking that Hegelian critique of mathematics and turning it against Hegel and Marx. But the original argument was actually kind of pro Hegel and Marx, right? Because Hegel argues that mathematics tells you the, the what or the that, right? But doesn't tell you the why. And mm. he- Hegelian dialectics and the way Marx uses it too is supposed to tell you the why because right. in elucidating the problem, the solution becomes necessary once the contradictions of the problem become apparent or you become conscious of them, right? Or history becomes conscious of them or whatever. Um, but then you can even turn that against Marx, right? Because that's still, that might just be an, a wrong or inaccurate um, sort of analysis of history and of material production as well. Um, mm. And so that in that case, it wouldn't give you an accurate answer for the why. Or it gives you sort of a, a necessary answer, which maybe the answer isn't actually necessary, right? Maybe there is an opening for agency there, which uh, Mm. Marx is just not sort of leaving as much room for. 
interestingly enough, uh, Cohen says that Marx criticizes the French socialists because of their utopianism, which he says uh, was reactionary. So Marx claims that the French socialists were reactionaries. I think Cohen would flip this around and say, actually, the obstetric model of classical Marxism is reactionary because it doesn't really have a sufficient understanding of the why. It is very good with just the what and the that, but it really can't articulate the why because it doesn't have a meta-ethical frame. It doesn't have a mythos that's guiding it. And I think this goes to a guiding question that he asks at the beginning, which I fucking loved. He says... At the end of this all, I shall ask whether structural design is indeed enough, whether we can settle for changing the world and not also the soul. And I think that there's something really interesting in that because I think that that is going to open up to this question of the why as well because it's going to include more of a mythos. It's going to engage with my stuff, the imagination, with hyperstition, with <laughs> images and stuff like that. And I'm thinking a lot of Sartre actually, which it's just fucking a shame that Sartre's Marxism gets no love, man, because what Cohen is talking <laughs> about here, uh, it, but as soon as my book comes out, middle of next year, motherfuckers, July 2019, we will change the game on this. But uh, Sartre, <laughs> Sartre wrote uh, an essay in 1947 called Materialism and Revolution in which he's actually critical of the Marxists of his day in 19, the late 1940s in the same way that, that Marx is critical of the French socialists. So Marx criticizes the French socialists for being utopian and insufficient in their analysis. Uh, Sartre criticizes the Marxists for being too wedded to, uh, let's say, a similar type of utopian reactionary frame of thinking. And then what he develops in the Critique of Dialectical Reason is the reason is because they're too analytic. They're too wedded to a notion of what he calls analytic reason. Now, Cohen, I, I'm curious here because I think Cohen would probably draw some of Sartre's criticisms at some point because he's considered an analytic Marxist, but in a different sense. He's an analytic Marxist because he's an analytic philosopher who uses syllogistic reasoning and various other kind of like frames of argumentation and he can actually read him without banging your head against the wall. Um, <laughs> but it's different than what Sartre is immediately criticizing when he criticizes uh, analytic reason. What he's criticizing is the very same criticism that Cohen levels against Marxism based on Hegel and Schopenhauer's uh, frustrations with math, which is that analytic reason for Sartre can only ever articulate the that and the what. It can never actually articulate the why. It can never ground itself. It doesn't actually understand its own arche, its own beginning. And if dialectical reason means anything, which is why Sartre's text is called The Critique of Dialectical Reason, and I think what Cohen is getting at here is if it, if it means anything, it has to mean a sort of system that is grounding itself in its articulation of itself that then grounds itself as it's articulating itself. And there's this confusing circularity there um, that isn't just the circularity of like the repetition of the same, but that also progressive is the spiral. Sartre uses this notion of the spiral, that it increases at uh, increasing intensities and domains and magnitudes, but it's passing by similar places. But every time it passes by a point that it passed before, it's a different point because that point has been transformed, right? And so there's this, this accumulative transformative notion that Sartre calls the singular universal, where the universal is contained in every singular, but at the same time, every singular is a sort of like contraction of all universality, but it's still singular in its, its own ex instantiation. And so I think all of this is kind of like Cohen is doing something really similar here. And it'd be really interesting to kind of like examine both of these two figures together because they are like, I've never heard anybody talk about them in the same breath, but I think they're both critical uh, in a similar way, or at least that there's a, they're sensing something, even though I think their solutions to their criticism are going to be radically different. Yeah, that's super interesting. I'll be curious to see once we get to Cohen's more positive program, how it continues to compare with Sartre's project. Because I, I hadn't thought about that at all, but I'm, I'm seeing it now that you're bringing it up, the parallels. Cool, huh? I know. I, I, to me, man, this was like the most rich reading I've had in a long time. Yeah, I just I just fucking enjoy his writing, dude. <laughs> Me too. Even when he's doing like pure summary, um, it's just so clear, mm. and the turns of phrases are always great. Um, his style is still apparent. It's not that dry analytic philosophy that everybody hates and should hate because it sucks. Which is just <laughs> like a slave to form. Right. He actually has a style, right? And he's yeah. and he's um, has no problem actually throwing sort of, you know, fanciful uh, phrases and mixing metaphors and stuff like that in a way that's just still abundantly clear. Yeah, and he uses like biography, like his own biography. He started off lecture three or chapter three or whatever it is with his own sort of experience as a young Jewish boy, like meeting the leader of the Canadian Communist Party, you know? 
and and how he was like he had questions and then that kind of like launches him into this lovely examination of the dialectic and Marx and I'm like oh it's he's he's a very lovely writer real quick I wanted to ask you something uh, before we wrap this up and go into the sticky leaves segment you said that that Cohen does not believe that this uh, obstetric metaphor is sufficient. Do you want to talk about the, the the sort of syllogistic reasons that he provides that kind of show why it is the case that sure, just because you're experiencing these birth pangs, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the moment of birth? Like, because I thought that they were really important in, in kind of unfolding his argument. Are you talking about the PQ, uh, PQR theses? The PQR and then the one, two, three, which they map onto each other. But PQR in particular, I think, is just really simple. If we just kind of outline that one, what do you think? Yeah, sure. I have PQR here. Do you want to talk about one, two, three? I don't have that written down. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Do PQR. So um, I kind of labeled this the, the Marxist thesis, um, as Cohen describes it. And it's got three theses labeled by uh, the letters P, Q, and R. Uh, P is that widespread major changes in ideas about society arise in response to changes in its mode of production. So that's kind of like the um, supervenience thesis of historical or dialectical materialism, right? Any changes in the superstructure are caused by or supervene on changes in the material mode of production. Very, you know, traditional Marxist belief that anyone who's familiar with Marxism probably has an idea about. Uh, Q, the second one, is that ideas critical of a mode of production arise on a broad scale only when and because that mode is obsolescent or sort of doesn't matter anymore, as no, no longer suited to the needs of production. So that kind of follows from uh, the P thesis. Um, if ideas change because the mode of production changes, then ideas critical of a mode of production would only arise when that mode is sort of falling apart, when it's not suiting the needs of production anymore. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the third one is R which is that when the mode of production is obsolescent um, and these critical ideas arise, the means of transforming the mode of production so that suitability to the needs of production will be restored will be found within that existing mode of production itself. So this is the solution is found in the depths of the problem idea we've been referencing throughout the episode here. Um, and so the, each of the theses kind of builds on each other to that third one, which is the big one, which is that as modes of production wind down, become sort of useless and no longer actually produce anymore, that's when ideas critical of that mode of production will arise. And that's only when you can change the mode of production at that time. So that's, that's sort of the encapsulation of the obstetric metaphor, right? You have to go through the whole nine month process of development before the baby can be delivered. And only then, once that process has happened, will the baby begin to sort of squeeze itself out? And so your job is to sort of recognize that, be aware of it, be conscious of the process, and then help the baby out when it's doing its work. Mm. Yeah. And he kind of maps this on in the next chapter then to the critique of Euclidean geometry, which sounds like, what the fuck? How does that happen? But it basically goes like this. So... Instead of P, Q, and R, we now have 1, 2, and 3, propositions 1, 2, and 3. And proposition 1 is, if there is a solution to a genuine problem, then it will be found if and only if when the problem is presented in its fully developed form. Proposition 2 is, there always is a solution to a genuine problem. But because of proposition 1, uh, that a genuine problem will only find its solution when the problem is fully presented. Because of that, it, there always is a general, or there always is a solution to the genuine problem, but it will be found if and only when the problem is presented in its fully developed form. And then the third one is the completion of the development of a genuine problem, and only that provides its solution. Its solution is the consummation of the full development of the problem. And so then he goes on to say that this is a sort of like political reading of these various, uh, that there is a political reading of these theses that isn't just simply a mathematical reading or a scientific reading. Um, but the political reading is the one that we kind of talked about, that, that all socialist theory needs to do is to appropriately articulate the problem, to, to find the best way to understand the problem, and then to make that explicit to the proletariat. 
right? And that was where the quote from Engels came from, the idea that the revolution is the problem's solution or resolution. And then he says that uh, he thinks that this really kind of like descends from a Hegelian idea, which he says few would now regard as consonant with the demands of a rigorous science. And he says, and then notice how strong the central claim is. Scientific socialism offers no ideals or values to the proletariat. What the communists do is simply tell it like it is, to tell the proletariat how it is. And then he goes on to indicate how deeply this is uh, this idea is entrenched within classical Marxism. That's seductive, right? I mean, he never says it there, but it sure sounds like he's kind of implying a lot of the really horrible moral catastrophes in 20th century socialism stem in part from this sort of optimism that one is not really an agent. Right? Mm. One is really just sort of a pawn of history. Mm. I mean, so Sartre breaks with the the French Communist Party in 1956 after the Soviet invasion of Hungary. And the reason was because he thought that the Soviet Union was guided by this obstetric model. Uh, he doesn't use that language. He says that the Soviet Union was guided by a sort of analytic reason. And what they did is they inscribed the limits of what was right and what was wrong, but they themselves were exempt from it. They were sort of standing outside as the analysts looking at things, telling everybody, this is what's happening, this is what you ought to do, sort of like pulling the strings a little bit, but that they themselves were sort of immune from any sort of like getting their hands dirty or any sort of criticism because they were the ones that they, they created the limits of what was right and what was wrong, what was appropriate action, what was not appropriate action, what was good theory, what was bad theory, etc. And so Sartre uh, and a lot of people in France, uh, actually in, and around the world, but a lot of people in France had a break with the Communist Party at that time because the Communist Party in France would not um, – they would not criticize the Soviet Union for some of these sort of more, let's say, unethical activities. And I think that there's something similar going on here too. It's like, what are the implications of that? If you are immune, if you are so guided by this obstetric metaphor of history and you yourselves then become immune to the dirtiness of your own involvement as you're kind of creating that very history, what are the implications of that? What could that potentially lead to? And it could potentially lead to, and historically did potentially lead to, um, some calamitous historical activities. And dude, that's the exact same kind of thinking we see with technocratic liberalism today, right? Moderate, minimal welfare state capitalism, liberal capitalism is the only real um, workable, rational political economic process. And our job is to just sort of be technocrats on the side, tweaking the dials, so to speak, to make things not, you know, be terrible for the worst off. And there's really nothing else we can do because it's just a necessary historical process that's sort mm. of culminated, right? Um, it's the exact same kind of thinking, right? And it's how you excuse as a political leader, right, your involvement in processes that, that cause massive poverty and misery, right? Mm. Well, I'm not really an agent. I'm not really doing this. It's not really my decision. I'm just tweaking the dials. Mm. There's kind of a post hoc rationality there, isn't there? That it's sort of like you're immune from anything and you're exempt from anything, but then after the fact, you can look back and you can be like, no, no, but that was that was necessary. That got us to where we are now. Do you see what I'm getting at? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it's very comforting, right? Yeah. Because any mistakes that happen on the way, you don't have to actually take responsibility for them or even have to worry about the idea of responsibility. Right. And I think what Cohen is is really trying to work through is, okay, yes, we can we can both be aware of the past and, and the things that have led us to where we are, but we also need to be accurately aware of where we are. And then simultaneously, we need to have a vision of where we're going, even if that vision changes. Like, even, even if we're guided by a, a set of images that we don't really understand, let's say, what the recipe for dinner is going to be, we still got to fucking start with something. And I think he... He thinks that a lot of Marxist thinking is insufficient in its in its recipe making. Yeah, this is the the kitchen metaphor, right? Yeah. Um, is Marxists will say something like, "You you can only cook with the kitchen you're given," so to speak, right? And you can't sort of um, plan for future kitchens, or in his phrase, write recipes for future kitchens. Mixing metaphors about the kitchen and the recipes you're writing, and he wants to say, "We can write recipes for future kitchens." And we need to, actually. 
um, all the while understanding what our current kitchen is made of, right? And so he wants to come again, combine those those two things that uh, liberal egalitarianism and Marxism seem to be at an impasse about. Hmm. Yeah. No, it's so really this, interesting. Yeah. It's really quick to tie this back to that first chapter we talked about um, in the first episode on this book. Um, the epistemic pride thing, right? This idea that we are sort of uh, a subject against the world and we're rationally figuring out what the world's actually like and our sort of our background and our history doesn't really have anything to do with it, right? He started to show an argument or produce an argument that works against that and demonstrates that we don't really have epistemic justification for much of anything that we believe. Um, he kind of leaves that on the table, right? And just kind of goes off and leaves it. But the point of that, he brings it back, at least kind of teases it here, is that Marxism has this kind of epistemic pride in mm. that it, it thinks that we sort of have this knowledge of the necessary development of history. Mm. Um, and sometimes we don't use Marxist terms anymore, but we even, you know, as we're talking about technocratic liberals have that same sort of notion, right? That capital H history is just chugging along and we don't really have that much agency in how it works. We can't really mm. write these, you know, more idealistic uh, recipes for future kitchens. And so he wants to, I think he's going to probably talk about how Marxism um, is kind of false prey to that epistemic pride he's talking about in chapter one. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling he'll probably make a similar critique about liberal egalitarianism once we get to that section of the book. Interesting. Uh, there are two quotes real quick, if I, can, if I can mention them. One is from Marx, one is from Luxembourg, and then one is Cohen's, I think, summa summating summation of, of everything in this chapter. The Marx uh, quote comes from uh, a contribution to the critique of political economy. And it basically says, so therefore, mankind always takes up only such problems as it can solve. Since, looking at the matter more closely, we will always find that the problem itself arises only when the material conditions necessary for its solution already exist or are at least in the process of formation. This is kind of what we've been talking about, but I just wanted to give a, a quote from Marx. So again, it's mankind always takes up only such problems as it can solve, right? And so the Luxembourg quote is, he presents it in kind of like two phases. It's a long sentence, but he divides it in half. And he does that for a strategic purpose. But I'm going to read the whole quote. Here it is. The socialist system of society should only be and can only be a historical product, born out of the school of its own experiences, born in the course of its realization, as a result of the developments of living history, which, and then this is the second half, just like organic nature of which, in the last analysis, it forms a part, has the fine habit of always producing along with any real social need the means to its satisfaction, along with the task simultaneously the solution. This is what Cohen immediately says. The first half of this sentence is true, interesting, and important. But then he says the second half is wrong. This is the first half again. The socialist system of society should only be, and can only be, a historical product, born out of the school of its own experiences, born in the course of its realization, as a result of the developments of living history. That, he says, is true. What he says is not true is that just like organic nature, of which it forms a part, has a fine habit of always producing, along with any real social need, the means to its satisfaction, along with the task simultaneously to the solution. And this is what Cohen says. He says, For I believe not only that the obstetric conception is false, but also that it has done a great deal of damage. If you think of politics obstetrically, you risk supposing what Lenin called the concrete analysis of a concrete situation will disclose transparently what your political intervention must be, so that you do not expect and therefore do not face the uncertainties and hard choices with which a responsible politics must contend. And I really like that. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly what we've been talking about with this idea of having historical grounding of where our politics is at and what's possible, but then not assuming that that historical grounding gives us the answer. We're responsible for figuring out the answer. And yeah, and see- That's a weight on us that's not comfortable, but it's true. Yeah, and this is where more existentialist Marxists kind of come in, and I think this is why I, I was really thinking about Sartre a lot, because that's, 
That's obviously mm-hmm. Sartre comes out of the existentialist tradition, so his engagement with Marxism is much less inclined towards the obstetric model or towards the economistic model or a teleological model. I mean, Sartre in the critique like vociferously argues against those things. And this is almost Cohen's effort to almost be like reintroduce the necessity of an existential personal uh, responsibility, like an ethical dimension to your Marxism. And I love that. Yeah, you can tell I'm totally into that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, yeah. And then I think in the next couple of chapters, he's just going to continue building on this, right? And he says at the end, he's like, listen, man, he's like, I'm not trying to, and this is my summation, he's like, I'm not trying to shit on Marx. I'm not trying to shit on Marxism. And at the same time, I'm not trying to shit on the utopians and the socialists. He's like, what I want to do is I want to problematize and complicate both of them. And I think he's going to, in a Hegelian sense, he's going to going to kind of synthesize uh, scientific socialism with utopian socialism. Do you think so? Yeah, I think it's no surprise that he's saying Marx has these three strands, which Lenin talked about, right? And that he also has these three strands, uh, mm. Marxism, religion, and uh, liberal egalitarianism. That's, I think, no coincidence. Interesting. And I wonder if it's going to map onto his historical experience, you know, as a boy, the Marxism and then maybe uh, through graduate school, egalitarian liberalism, and then in his more recent years, how he said he's become more interested in the idea of Christianity and mythos and things like that. I wonder if that's going to kind of map onto his own historical uh, accidents. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see if he actually points that out. And if he doesn't, we can always bring it back. <laughs> we'll call him from the grave. <laughs> All right, so for our last segment, we're doing these sticky leaves. This is where one of us talks about whatever it is that's bringing us meaning in a potentially meaningless world, although we haven't determined that yet, so don't be fully uh, buying into the meaninglessness part. Austin, what's doing it for you? Dude, I think I really like poetry. (laughs) I went to a poetry reading the other night. And I have off and on dabbled with poetry. I mean, I've got a half sleeve tattoo on my arm that is dedicated to a poet that is inspired by a poem that he wrote. John Milton wrote a poem called Il Penseroso. It's these dual poems. One's called Il Penseroso. The other's called L'Allegro. And the idea was that I would get one on one arm and one on the other arm. And, you know, the Il Penseroso poem is all about how when he's old, he just wants to be left alone with his books in his tower under the moonlight, listening to the song of the nightingale sing melancholy. And, And so I've got like... Basically, it's inspired by Rembrandt's The Philosopher Reading. I've got like an old Aristotle philosopher looking dude, bald head, huge beard. That's going to be me in like 50 years, 50 years, 30 years, <laughs> five years. Um, and uh, and then, you know, it's got like the nightingale and uh, uh, he's like in his, his library with his books and there's like the moon and shit like that. And and I love it. And then the other arm was going to be all about like – and the, the poems all about, like when he's young, he wants to dance and drink and celebrate with the god Bacchus, the god of wine and, and stuff like that. And the other arm was going to be all about that. But So I've, I've, I've dabbled with poetry. I enjoy poetry. But I think I'm really starting to love poetry, man. Um, when I was in Ireland most recently, when I was living there, I went through a phase for a couple months where every morning I would wake up and I would read like a William Carlos Williams poem and sort of have – a time of meditation and thought and just kind of sit on my back patio with my morning tea, whether it was raining or not. We had this lovely little patio furniture and we would just, I would just sit there and, and I, I really enjoy poetry. And I, I went to this poetry reading here in Sydney the other day and I'm starting to think why I love poetry so much. And I think it's because I'm starting to become really interested in words and I've, I've thought a lot about language over the years and uh, and a lot of my work doesn't necessarily directly deal with language but circles around a lot of concerns within the philosophy of language. And I have some formed ideas or forming ideas about the philosophy of language that I think inform a lot of my other philosophical and political economic endeavors. But I'm really interested in language from a couple of different fronts. And I think it really starts from my work as being an actor. And it's because... And I was talking about this with a buddy of mine the other day. We were talking about uh, Coriolanus. Um, when, When you watch the film Coriolanus, which is obviously Shakespeare, right? And, and, you, and you can understand who it is that actually can handle the language in, uh, in the text. It makes the text so much richer, you know? Like, 
we were talking about the difference between, let's say, Baz Luhrmann's fucking Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio and who was it? Claire Danes? Um, yeah. And... You know, it, 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 it seems like actors who have made a choice about the emotion of the scene and then say the words as though the words are tangential, you know? Whereas someone who is a Shakespearean actor, somebody like a, a Rafe Fiennes or a Mark Rylance or a Vanessa, Redga- uh, Vanessa Redgrave, who's in the film adaptation of Coriolanus, when they are handling the the language, but they actually understand the words, it creates a completely different dynamic. And it's because I think there's something so potent in just like individual words that that words as they open us up to these constellations of meaning and are surrounded by these swirling clouds of emotion that we get sucked into them. And I think I'm just really, I'm really seduced by people that have a mastery over language and that can use language and wield it in a way to induce or elicit emotion. And I don't know. I think that that's why I'm starting to really enjoy poetry. And this poetry reading, it was like there were four like full-time poets, like people who publish books and shit like that, four like house readers or whatever. And then they do an open mic. And of the four, uh, like let's call them professional readers, they, I would say two of them I thought were amazing and the other two I thought were, you know, okay. But the one that I thought was so amazing, her poetry was able to suck me in and draw me in and stimulate my thought. It was like a meditative experience that I was being guided along as she was taking me into these fields of emotion and meaning and thought and relationship and experience and history and even science because the title of her new book is called Autobiochemistry. Um, I guess she studied chemistry and particularly biochemistry and so she writes a lot about her fascination with chemicals but in a way that that isn't like dehumanizing or just simply like scientistic but that that kind of like melds together her connection and trying to connect with the material world. And I thought it was so fucking lovely. And yeah, man, I I'm I think I love poetry. And so and now I'm reading The Monday Ad by Justin Clemens, who's like a Bedou Lacan scholar here in Australia. But he wrote this like fucking epic book that's like this long fucking poem or it's a collection of poems, but it's not like individual poems, at least from what I can tell it isn't. It's like this long ode and it's just really fucking cool because he's also a philosopher and so it's like a philosophical poetic journey that I'm going on with him and I just I don't know man I think it's beautiful I have a theory dude okay so this is probably not actually any very novel at all but I'm just thinking about it right now yeah um it seems like we as human beings we get interested in things and to the point where they eventually become like primary goods like we care about them just for their own sake Mm -hmm. and as we become more and more familiar with them, we get more and more interested in the form of the thing, even regardless of its like pure contents or what it can do for us um, sort of practically. So like, and this is where I think poetry can be an example of this. Like, so for me, basketball is something I love, right? I've loved it ever since I was a kid. I never no. knew a world that, where I didn't love basketball, right? <laughs> and it got to the point where I love it even just for the aesthetic, I care about the aesthetic value of it. Mm. Even if my team doesn't win or the things that I originally cared about um, actually obtain, right? Mm. And like music does the same sometimes too, right? Like you care about music because it makes you feel a certain way and you like that feeling. And then eventually you start caring about the form of the thing itself and the aesthetic sort of principles that are involved. And not even just aesthetic in terms of, um, you know, the, the musical characteristics, but just the form of the very thing, right? And like poetry... It seems to be a point when academics, and I think philosophers especially, tend to just become interested in poetry for the same reason. Like, you just Mm. care about sort of the rhythm and and, and syntactical ordering of words Mm. for their own sake. And they have their own value regardless of the content in some respects or like the meaning behind things. Um, And that's an important transition, I think. It's not just for play, right? Those things Mm. end up having their own intrinsic value, those aesthetic things. It's like poetry kind of, and a lot of times brings that out, right? There's even just the ordering and rhythm of and cadences behind speech and words has this value to itself. And as a philosopher, you kind of get interested in like what that means, right? Like mm. what that implies or what the 
the content of the form itself is, regardless of the some original content or whatever. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, and I think that it's much, it's much more difficult to become fascinated with the orated word. Like I am enamored by people who are grammarians with and that are just so eloquent with their speech because I just find it to be so fucking difficult. But I think it's it's easier for me to engage at the written level because the person had time to stop and say, okay, this is what my sentence is going to be, right? And I'm I'm starting to become fascinated, like, why that sentence? Why did you put that word there? Like, what does this word mean? And why not a synonymous word? And even though they might be synonymous, they're not the same. They have different resonances. They open us up to different fields. And unfortunately, we don't have, as a good friend of mine recently told me, she said, we don't have time for time, which I thought was fucking <laughs> rocked my shit. But she's absolutely right. We don't have the time for time to be able to really engage always with the things that we read or that we're consuming, especially if we're in any way in school or in the academic world or we have like a reading list that we're trying to get to. Or even if you're just fucking trying to read leisurely you and you have to work on Monday and this is your Sunday day of reading, we still are under the gun of these external pressures and we don't have time for time to be able to indulge in the selective choices of the words. And I also think that that goes into the craftsmanship of the words themselves. And I noticed this in myself and this is one of my biggest uh, frustrations and then I would say also points that I'm trying to get better at. Let's say it's my New Year's resolution for the rest of my life is to really become quite intentional with the things that I say, the activities that I participate in, and the words that I write. And it's very difficult because of constraints and because of habits and because you just kind of get caught up in the flow sometimes and you just say shit, laziness, whatever. Those are all various things that affect my output, but I'm really interested in, yeah, syntactical structure of sentences and what it is that this particular phrase means and elicits and what is it not saying why didn't they choose these words and and i think this is also why ironically enough i've really gotten into derrida uh in recent months and so i don't know man i just uh, i'm starting to fall in love with poetry yeah i get it man i get it and i i found this a similar um process not just with poetry i would i would say but with reading philosophy and doing a lot more uh reading of analytic philosophy and being able to pretty easily distinguish people who are masters of language from people who are slaves to form mm. and how much it can do for you in making persuasive arguments and cases. And that you can make the most, you know, develop the most persuasive syllogism, right? But it doesn't actually have the same like illocutionary uh, nature as a, a well worded um, argument. Mm. And there's maybe something irreducible about that. I'm not really sure, but it seems very clear to me that, that there's something there. I, dude, I 100%. And I don't think that we can just simply say that, oh, the flowery language is just a waste and it's emotionally like, like you're wasting words or it's like emotionally manipulative. No, 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 no. This is the fucking point of communication here is to try to use every tool at our disposal to communicate, to elicit, to connect, Right. And I think that there's something so wonderful about poetic language because it doesn't seem to be wasteful. Whereas maybe previously I was like, man, just fucking say what you're trying to say, right? But I want to be more patient and I want to give more time to time for words to resonate. Yeah, it's very platonic, but there's something about grasping a concept that doesn't just happen by pure explanation. Right. Mm. Sometimes you have to dance around it. Sometimes you have to play with concepts to get them elicited. It's especially with more difficult, complex ideas. I mean, I would say that the concept is only the remainder of the tendency to dance around, which is all we ever do. Yeah, sure, whatever, uh, Dionysius. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that the same the same outcome though, right, is that we we don't need to have this like brute, almost like a mathematical or formalized sense of language um that's devoid of any sort of color like it's not just because it's ugly it also just doesn't actually work the same way mm. interesting 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, poetry's fucking rad. Go read some poems. William Carlos Williams was my homie for a bit. Down with that motherfucker. If you want some read English real, poetry. Read Wheelbarrow and shit, right? It was his early poetry, which was actually a lot less experimental, uh, which is a little bit more romantic. Hmm. You've seen Patterson, right? I did see Patterson, yeah. I fucking love that movie. It's such a good movie. I know. I love that movie. I mean, if, even if you're going to go read, like, Shel Silverstein, Where the Sidewalk Ends, just go read some poetry, people. Come on. Just have time. Take some time. Take some time for time. Get fired, right? <laughs> Get laid off. Exactly. Just take no, please, time. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I guess we'll wrap up the episode there. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, feel free if you want to get information about like when episodes are uploaded or if there's any other information that we are going to be disseminating. We can hit us up on our Facebook group, Owls at Dawn on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter, Owls underscore at underscore Dawn. Like I said at the beginning, we've got a Patreon account that uh, is really uh, going to help us. One, it helps pay for our hosting of our website. And then also we're going to hopefully try to beef up some better technology, better microphones and things like that. And then also it'll help us have more time for time so that we can hopefully produce some more content uh, and be more consistent with that. So if you can go to Patreon, that would be uh, really beneficial to us. And we are, I know I keep saying this, but I, I swear to God, we are going to be more uh, producing more bonus content. Actually, Troy and I just had a little meeting before we recorded about uh, in the coming months how we're going to be producing uh, more uh, bonus content that's going to be exclusively for patrons. I'm going to be doing a couple of interviews in the, in the next month with people that are going to be for patron-only uh, access. So uh, go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn. And you can find out how to become a patron. You can email us, owls at dawn podcast at gmail.com. iTunes, reviews, ratings. Troy, what else, bro? Just one more thing, dude. What is going on? Gastadania, America. Yeah.